Um, one night at uh, Oz's house, uh, Mac and, and Chet Atkins were singing songs back and forth and, and going through old songs. And Chester surprised me. I knew you knew a bunch, but Chester surprised me. He absolutely locked me out. I remember those old pop songs. I did a lot of pop disc jockey work back in my early days in radio and around. And, and to me, when I was growing up, Bing Crosby and Wilf Carter had network shows back to back, and I enjoyed them equally as well, you know. But we're sitting out there at Oz's place. I always afraid I wasn't going to get invited back because I was the last dog hung. I'd just stay there after everybody was gone. <laughs> but anyhow, I was singing some of those old songs, and Chet was picking them, and I'd uh, do a verse or a chorus or something, and he'd fill me in with the words. So I asked him, I said, I knew you could pick them, but I'm amazed at how many of them you know the lyrics to. And he said, well, I had to learn the lyrics to them to know how to pick them good. <laughs> so that talk, made, made a lot of rationale to me. Talk about Chet like, liking to sing. He, he made some records singing early in his career. And uh, I ran across one of them one day. And I picked him up at the airport. And uh, the limelighters were on the same flight with him. So he invited t to me to take them where they wanted to go, too. He just offered my services, which he would do to me all the time. <laughs> and so they got in the car. And he's sitting in the back seat right behind me. And I just bought me a new Chevrolet. And... Uh, he turned to the one that was sitting there back in the back with him, and he said, uh, I'm sorry uh, that we're having a ride like this. Uh, I have a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> and the title of that song that he had recorded was, I may be colorblind, but I know when I'm blue, <laughs> which I thought was one of the worst titles I've ever heard in my life. So I just looked up in the rearview mirror, and he didn't know I'd heard this. And I said, I may be colorblind, but I know when I'm blue. And he shut up. <laughs> Speaking of Chet, he does, uh, I spoke with Chet's sister uh, last night, Billy Rose. And Chet is, you know, we've all known that Chet's been ill. But he's doing well, but he just wasn't quite well enough. But I'm glad that we y'all thought of him because I was supposed to tell you that he sends his regards, and he knows that this, and the words were, this would have been better for him than anything, but he just wasn't quite able to make it today. So I tell well, you, he does in his regards. What, one other thing about Chad, I talked to him last week, uh, but this, his daughter, Merle, uh, married, and her last name was Russell, and she married, and she had a son, and she named the son Jonathan. And Chet is standing there looking in the crib, and she, he says, Merle, why did you do that? <laughs> she said, do what, Daddy? He said, why did you name that child Jonathan? She said, well, I love the name Jonathan. He said, do you know what they'll call that kid when he gets grown? She said, yeah, Daddy, they'll call him Johnny. Oh, God, Daddy, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know that Chet's hobby is comedy. And Chet and I have run around together, especially back in the early days. And I know a lot about him privately. But one of his great loves in the world is to study the comedic art. That's why he loved Homer and Jethro and all you guys so much. Because those little offhanded things that he does are not accidental. He knows exactly what he's talking about. And he gets great laughs. He told me something about his sister one time, right after his father died. Now, bear in mind that Chet makes this stuff up and he puts you on. Now, what I'm going to tell you is not really true, but he gets you going and you think he's telling you the truth. <laughs> and I went over to his office and I said, Chet, I knew your dad. A lot of people around here didn't, and he was a wonderful little man. He said, yeah, that they ran Daddy's well in the office over in Knoxville last week. I said, well, I'm sure sorry that he's gone. I said, well... When we was little, he used to hurt us. I said, what are you talking about? He says, when he'd get mad at one of us, he'd tell us we wasn't his. I said, well, Chet, is that really true? I said, how do you know that? He said, well, he give Jim a farm. He said, he give me a house. Give Billy Rose a dollar. We finally found out which one it was. <laughs> oh, God. Oswald. Uh, all, all men are talking about uh, hospitals and nursing homes and everything. You haven't lived to go on a trip with Uncle Dave Macon. Everybody knows Uncle Dave Macon, I hope. All right. We played a nursing home here, and, and 
the city, Nashville. Roy and all of his boys, and Uncle Dave Macon, went out to nursing them. We played. We done our part, and Roy introduced Uncle Dave to come out. Uncle Dave walked down on the stage, and he looked at them. They had shawls all around them and bent over and, you know, sleeping and everything else. Everybody worked nursing homes. And Uncle Dave said, well, I may be a little old and ugly, but I don't feel a damn bit lonesome here today. <laughs> <laughs> Dale, that's a tough act to follow, but I think you've got a song. Oh, Lord. Well, yeah. <laughs> you've been talking about uh, elves. We, I didn't happen to have a song. Oh, we talking about, about Elvis. Him. No, no. You're talking about a few minutes ago about little elves. Oh. You said Mac Wiseman looked like an elf. <laughs> you sure he said elves? <laughs> Uh, can I use your guitar, Bill? Sure. Dickens said, don't look at him when you talk about that. <laughs> no, he's uh, he's a uh, leader of the group. You know, I, you don't. <laughs> That's right. Uh, because this is about a little elf who lives way up the North Pole. And he was called Say Joe. Give me your pick. You got a pick? Thank you. Very much. Okay, thank you. Very much. This is a good one. The guitar, your band leader's ready. We're ready? All right. <laughs> There's a little old elf way up north living at the cold North Pole. He's a big help to old Santa Claus. They call him Little St. Joe. On Christmas Eve he can be found trotting through the snow. Rounding up the reindeers, hitching up the sleigh, shining little Rudolph snows. Say, Joe, Santa's little heifer, keeping an eye on the flock. He never gets mad, cause all the other elves are working in the big workshop. Slipping and a sliding and a jumping for joy. The only job he knows is drowning up the reindeers, hitching up the sleigh, shining little Rudolph snow. Say, Joe, Santa's little shepherd, keeping an eye on the flock. He never gets mad, cause all the other elves are working in the big workshop. Slipping and sliding and a jumping for joy. The only job he knows is rounding up the reindeers, hitching up the sleigh and shining little Rudolph snow. Cute, cute, cute. Yeah. Well, I guess you're screwed. That's it, baby. Thanks for all them mics, folks. <laughs> Well, that one kept going out. We was just I trying know. to help you. Oh, well, we have to, I may have to sing it again. I don't mind We had you in stereo, 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 stereo. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that's a cute song. Did you write that? No, uh, we did not. You take it away from me. You don't have a microphone no, now. No, <laughs> 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 no, uh, no uh, you'll know the guy that did, though, because he wrote the same place you did one time, Hank Mills. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. He wrote your uh, Girl on the Billboard. Girl on the Billboard, yeah. yeah. He, I did uh, eight or ten or twelve songs, whatever it was, of his. Jan Howard's got a song written by a struggling songwriter named Irving Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh, he wrote a few. Come over here and do this one. This is one everybody can kind of join in on, and uh, I'm surprised we've gone this long and haven't done it yet. I know it. It is. I know everybody sings a song, and everybody's... Heard it a jillion times, but I still love to sing it, White Christmas. And I can't help but think of my children each time I do. Everybody can't sing with me.
the snow I'm dreaming of a white Christmas With every Christmas card I write May your day Just like the ones I used to know Where the treetops glisten And children listen to hear Sleigh bells in the snow That'll put you right in the Christmas mood. Thank you. Little Jim. What? What was Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Jimmy Dean now, do I? <laughs> what was Christmas like at your house? I'm so sad I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> Listening to all these poor people. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Would you, you wait till Thanksgiving next? <laughs> <laughs> really? Now, you know what it's like in the coal mines. That's where I was raised, in the mountainous part of West Virginia. Had so many kids in the family, they knew they couldn't buy presents for everybody, so they usually sent me and fertilizer on a trip. <laughs> we didn't get back till the 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> Presents, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's too many not to buy presents for. <laughs> There's too many. <laughs> no, we had a wonderful time. It, just like all the rest of you talking about the apples and the oranges, and you was glad to get them. Mm -hmm. Where I came from, yeah. back in West Virginia. Sing us a song. Sing a song? Yeah. Hey, Lord, help me. Me too. Boodle Bryant wrote this song. You probably never heard it. It was the flip side of a flop record I had. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I have heard it. There is one thing for sure. If you're rich or if you're poor, there's no place like home on Christmas. The only thing the same is the date and the name. If you can't be at home on Christmas. Sometimes when I am dreaming, it all comes back to me. I 
our happy family around our Christmas tree all gathered singing carols as happy as could be there's no place like home on Christmas The fruitcake sure is fine Aged in beds, all homemade wine There's no place like home on Christmas And no restaurant in this land Makes a roast like mommy can there's no place like home on Christmas. That good old turkey dressing can't be equal anywhere. The pie is something rare. There's always some to spare. I'll bet. That even seven spins an extra moment there. There's no place like home on Christmas. There's no place like home on Christmas. Nobody sings a ballad like Little Jim. Oh, I've been me having so much fun. I'm a little bit hoarse, and I know everybody knows about it. They are the same. You know, yeah. Shepard, I, I was feeling for you, and I know you was feeling for me, okay? <laughs> However, this is fun. Me and Jimmy was out together. <laughs> uh, Don't tell Mona and Benny. <laughs> Let me tell you why I've learned something here today about showmanship. You don't follow Kitty Wells singing Jingle Bells with some version called Bingle Jails. <laughs> <laughs> you take it by itself, it's pretty funny. I tell you. Right, Jim? I used to do it in the theater, remember? But that's showmanship. You don't do that. That's well, do you think I'm going to follow little Jimmy Dickens singing a ballad? No way. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. We, uh... We've got the same group here today that we had at our very first country family reunion, except two people are not here. Yeah. And I know everybody joins me in, in missing our friend Justin Tubb and our friend Grandpa Jones. There's, uh, there's a big hole in the room because they're not here. And yet, uh, you listen to that song, No Place Like Home at Christmas, and we know that they're in a better home. Yeah. Grandpa made one of the greatest records not only christmas records grandpa jones made one of the greatest records i think that's ever been made in this town or any other town dicky lee was telling me a while ago he carries us around in his car and listens to it throughout the year you don't wait till just christmas time to listen to this and i thought today since um, since we're missing grandpa that uh, maybe we ought to just listen to what he did the beautiful recitation that he did called the christmas guest Kind of is our way of, of having Grandpa here with us at Christmas time. Sure. It happened one day near December's end. Two neighbors called on an old time friend, and they found a shop so meager and mean, made gay with a thousand boughs of green. And Conrad was sitting with face a-shine When he suddenly stopped as he stitched the twine And he said, old friends, at dawn today When the cock was a crowing the night away The Lord appeared in a dream to me And said, 
I'm coming your guest to be. So I've been busy with feet of stir, strewing my shop with branches of fir. The table is spread and the kittle is shine, and over the rafters the holly is twined. And now I'll wait for my Lord to appear. And listen closely so I will hear his step as he nears my humble place. And I open the door and look on his face. So his friends went home and left Conrad alone, for this was the happiest day he had known. For long since his family had passed away, and Conrad had spent many a sad Christmas day. But he knew with the Lord as his Christmas guest, this Christmas would be the dearest and best. So he listened with only joy in his heart, and with every sound, he would rise with a start and look for the Lord to be at his door like the vision he had a few hours before. So he ran to the window after hearing a sound, but all he could see on the snow-covered ground was a shabby beggar whose shoes were torn and all of his clothes were ragged and worn. But Conrad was touched and he went to the door and he said, your feet must be frozen and sore. I have some shoes in my shop for you and a coat that'll keep you warmer too. So with grateful heart, the man went away. But Conrad noticed the time of day and he wondered what made the dear Lord so late and how much longer he'd have to wait. When he heard a knock, he ran to the door but it was only a stranger once more. A bent old lady with a shawl of black and a bundle of kindling piled on her back. She asked for only a place to rest, but that was reserved for Conrad's great guest. But her voice seemed to plead, don't send me away. Let me rest for a while on Christmas day. So Conrad brewed her a steaming cup and told her to sit at the table and sew. But after she left, he was filled with dismay, for he saw that the hours were slipping away, and the Lord hadn't come as he said he would, and Conrad felt sure he had misunderstood. When out of the stillness, he heard a cry, please help me and tell me where am I? So again he opened his friendly door and stood disappointed as twice before. It was only a child who had wandered away and was lost from her family on Christmas Day. Again, Conrad's heart was heavy and sad, but he knew that he could make the little girl glad, so he called her in and wiped her tears and quieted all her childish fears. Then he led her back to her home once more. But as he entered his own darkened door, he knew that the Lord was not coming today. For the hours of Christmas had passed away. So he went to his room and he knelt down to pray. And he said, Lord, why did you delay? What kept you from coming to call on me? For I wanted so much your face to see. When soft in the silence, a voice he heard, lift up your head, for I kept my word. Three times my shadow crossed your floor. Three times I came to your lowly door, for I was the beggar with bruised cold feet. I was the woman you gave something to eat, and I was the child on the homeless street. Three times I knocked, three times I came in, and each time I found the warmth of a friend, of all the gifts, love is the best. I was honored to be your Christmas gift.
you know, uh, in in some ways, we're very lucky that when we lose a friend like that, we never really lose them. How can you say he's gone when you can hear things like that that he did? And we'll always have that. It'll always be with us. And if we ever want to think about Grandpa, which we'll always do, but we can always go get that and listen to it or see a video of him doing it, and he's always with us and always will be. Well, you know, uh, Ramona told me the other day that I don't know if you were ever out at the house when they would do those little pickings and things that they would have. She said she was going to try to keep doing that, that as long as people would come out and do it. And she asked me, she said, you think people would come? I said, you're going to have food, ain't you? And I, hope that, I, hope that, I wish that they would come. I hope they would see the Opry. I think Phil's got his locker. And his locker at the Opry's right across from my locker. Bill's going to have his locker, I believe, is the way I understand it. Uh, Grandpa's locker is right across from mine, so I well, we all feel that loss. I believe Bill's have, have that locker now. Eloise said something to me when we passed uh, and visited with her and Ramona and yes, Lisa. She whispered into my ear, and she said, Miss Jeannie, she said, don't you let those people at the opera just throw Mama away now. So we got to keep that in mind. Uh, Hopefully the powers that be will invite her to bring her fiddle and uh, Lisa to bring her dulcimer and come and play with Eddie Stubbs some fiddle and uh, do some good things on the opera and let her continue to be a part of it because she has been since I can remember and she should be forever. Well, uh, let's, and whenever she calls about those meetings, let's don't forget those and let's go because yes. that will be an important thing to all of them. I never will forget, Lisa grabbed a hold of me and hugged me, and she said, I didn't want to put on black today. No, oh, what a great title for a song. I didn't want to put on black today. I wrote it yesterday. <laughs> I'm right in the back me, of it. Is there anything or anybody you don't know a story about? <laughs> or any color? <laughs> Ramona said to me, and, and um, I had to be out of town on the day of the funeral, and I called her before I left. And the last thing she said to me was, she said, just promise you'll always be my friend. And that's what we need to remember. Just promise me you'll always be my friend. You know, Bill, I think about, I talked to Ramona a couple of times, and, and each time I did, she said, I said, no, Ramona, we're going to be checking on you after, after the service, the week after, and the week after that, you know, when you go home and you're alone. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, please do. She said, she said don't let me go. Don't let me go. Yeah. And I think about us that are left behind. And I think about how sometimes we get, just to be honest, as a family, we love each other, but we get aggravated at each other so quickly. And, and we can see each other's faults so quickly. But yet, if we stop and look at what it's going to be like when we're gone, we're going to think about, we're going to be saying nice things about each other then. And I, I want us to all, to each, it, well, yeah, but we'll be going on to be with the Lord. And I, I hope we all get to hear those things about each other now. And maybe we not be so hard on each other. They might edit the this. roses while I live. Yeah. Yes. Not after I'm gone. Too late. Fred, what, what was Ramona's uh, uh, mood today and all when you talked with her? And uh, tell us a little bit about that because I know you called her. I asked her how she was doing. And she said... Uh, I make it pretty good through the day, but the night's awfully hard. She said, this is an awful lonesome place at night. And that Eloise had been over to stay two or three nights with her, and uh, uh, Alicia had come and stayed, and somebody else, I think. Uh, Rose Maddox, maybe? Rose Maddox, I think, stayed a couple of nights. Rosalie, yeah. Rosalie Mayfist, I'm sorry. Yeah, anyway, uh, she said, uh, don't you all forget me now? And I said, well, honey, we're not going to forget you. We love you, too, you know. And she said, well, you know, you meant so much to Grandpa. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
Grandpa didn't have a lot of faith in himself a lot of times, you know. And so when we were going to do the Christmas guest, uh, I didn't tell him what we were going to do, how we were going to do it. He just knew he was coming down to read it, you know. So when he arrived at the studio, he said, uh, uh, am I early or late? And I said, uh, well, you're neither one. Why, why? He said, well, it's the wrong day then. And I said, what are you talking about, Grandpa? He said, I thought I was supposed to record. I said, you are. He said, when? I said, now in a few minutes. What have they been doing? I said, waiting on you. <laughs> the whole orchestra, he didn't dream of that, see. And he said, I ain't never been so outnumbered in my life. <laughs> and, and he pulled me over in the corner and he said, now are you sure you want to do, you think I can do this? I'm, I ain't very good. And I said, Grandpa, you're not very good. You're very great. And don't you ever forget it. He said, well, you're just outrageous. He did that in one reading. Wow. Once. We ran it down a couple of times to get the balance and everything. And it, it, we was, it's hard to do that thing, that tempo, man. It really is. But that's the only tempo, I think, that it works. And I had to keep slowing it down. And finally he said, well, I believe that'll do. And he read it right through one time. He would, uh, somebody said a while ago, said the only person Grandpa ever got mad at was himself. Exactly. And, and that's probably really true. He, <laughs> he used to come up to me. He would want to do the Christmas guest on the Opry, but, but he couldn't remember all the words. And he would always say to me, how can you remember all them talking songs? I can't remember nothing. <laughs> and he'd get mad at himself because he couldn't, he couldn't remember it. But that recording, Fred, that y'all did is, is, like Johnny said, the, he'll always be with us through that. And that's a, that's a masterpiece for all time. Are you going to get, are we going on each side here? Oh, yeah, let's. Ah, now, we really talk about love. <laughs> let's talk about life. Let's talk about no, love. No, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's different kinds of love. There's all different kinds mm -hmm. of love. And we've done, I think, every time a Christmas song, except maybe this kind of a Christmas song. Guy that was born on Christmas Day, our friend Steve Warner and I got together last year and wrote this. We got two people in country music born on Christmas Day. Steve Warner and Barbara Mandrell were both, uh, both born on Christmas Day. Steve and I wrote this song. Um, a couple of Christmases ago. We actually wrote this one at Christmas time. It wasn't one of those uh, July songs that we had to wait for a year or so to do anything with it. And our friends in the group Alabama recorded it, and we made a record of it, too. If y'all will help me, this is, a, this is about the greatest love in the world. Johnny, you and Kitty can hold hands on this one if you want to. It's called Christmas in Your Arms. All my friends are asking me where I plan to spend the holiday. People seem to celebrate the season in so many different ways. Some go where the weather's freezing cold, while others like it warm. I don't care about the weather, just whether I spend Christmas in your arms. We could drive up to the mountain. Build a fire and watch it snow We could sail down to the islands Where the gentle breezes blow I'd be happy in the city I'd be happy on the farm I don't care where I spend Christmas As long as I spend Christmas in your arms Oh, I'm so fickle. It was only last December. I had no Christmas spirit in my heart. My world lay cold and shattered in the ashes of a dream that fell apart. But now you're here beside me. No greater gift is wrapped beneath my tree Than the arms you've wrapped around me And the precious gift of love you give to me We could drive up to the mountain Build a fire and watch it snow 
We could sail down to the islands where the gentle breezes blow. I'd be happy in the city. I'd be happy on the farm. I don't care where I spend Christmas as long as I spend Christmas in your arms. We could drive up to the mountains, build a fire and watch it snow. We could sail down to the islands where the gentle breezes blow. I'd be happy in the city. I'd be happy on the farm. I don't care where I spend Christmas as long as I spend Christmas in your arms. I don't care where I spend Christmas as long as I spend Christmas in your arms. Merry Christmas, baby. I hope this is the happiest Christmas that you've ever had. And I love both of you. And I thank you for singing that little song with me called Christmas in Your Arms. Thank you. Thank you. I had, when we were writing that song, Steve Warner sat over in the corner and he was, one time he was singing, We could drive up to the mountains, build a fire, and watch Hank Snow. <laughs> <laughs> Dickie Lee, where'd you spend Christmas as a, as a youngster? Where'd you grow up? Uh, well, I, I grew up on a farm, and uh, we lived right outside of Memphis, uh, a little place called White Haven. Uh, it was, uh, it was really way out there. Mike, Is that microphone on? We're not hearing you over here. Try one that's uh, got a battery in it you there. it wasn't on when I was telling that story? No, Merle, we haven't heard a word you said all day. It hadn't been on. <laughs> We're kidding you. No, I grew up in, uh, outside of Memphis. <laughs> In a little town called Whitehaven, it was a. I grew up on a 40-acre 40, 40 farm, and uh, you know we never, you know we never had a whole lot either. But I, I thought, you know, it's really funny because even going on through high school, I, I didn't know that we didn't have a lot, you know, until later. You know. And uh, but uh, you know we, we we lived right on the edge of the woods. We had we had a farm. It was a place I couldn't wait to get off of. Now I think, why did I ever want to leave that place? But uh, I remember. Uh, the year I got uh, my first Schwinn bicycle, which is which is more than a lot of you guys got, I guess. I but uh, but out there, you know, uh, of course you too. Like you almost needed a car back then to get around because our nearest neighbor was about two miles down the road. But uh, my brother and I both got a bike, and it was really fun. But just just all little kinds of things. I and I got a train too. Yeah, got an electric train. It smoked. I burned it up. You know. And, the day I got it, I think. You remember how you could smell that hot transformer smoke? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a nostalgic <laughs> smell. But, uh, but, but we just had, some, just had some great Christmases growing up out there. And uh, we were just kind of out there all by ourselves, and it was, it was really neat. And, and we used to, it seems like we used to get a lot of snow back then, a lot more than we do today. You've spent a lot of your career not only in country, but um, uh, with a lot of your friends in, in the rock and roll business because you've, uh, you've uh, had some hit records and written some songs for them. We were talking about uh, a lot of our country folks being overseas at Christmas, entertaining the troops. Do you, you guys ever do anything like that, or were you ever working a concert or anything at Christmas time? No, I never, I never entertained uh, overseas uh, during the holidays. I've entertained at prisons here during the holidays. But... Uh, I, it's you know it's really funny you, you talk about uh, my rock and roll and my country career and I it, when I when I had my first I I used to I started off I guess I was really heavily influenced by uh, Elvis Presley I grew up in Memphis and it was kind of a melting pot you had you know you got rock and roll rhythm and blues and country down there and and as it as it happened my first hit in 1961 it was a uh, it was considered rock and roll it was patches today it would be considered a country record mm -hmm. but. Uh, while I while I had that record out, that's when uh, I wrote. She thinks I still care. So I would go do all these rock and roll shows, and I'd try to get all my rock and roll buddies to listen to me. I would sing country songs backstage. <laughs> I'd sing Webb Pierce, Farron Young, and Hank Thompson. You know, that was that was kind of my repertoire back yeah. then. I, I want Dickie to sing. You mentioned Elvis. Skeeter's got a wonderful Elvis Christmas story about the time he was doing his uh, 
his Christmas album and how he was having such a hard time getting in the mood to sing Christmas songs. Share that with us while Dickie gets ready to sing. Fred, Fred probably knows this story too, being so close to Felton and Mary, Jarvis and Elvis. But Elvis, it was in July, very hot. And I think he was, uh, I think it was July because we always, Christmas in July, it was kind of like a little cliche. But it was very hot and they kept, they had the, uh, recording session planned and of course the musicians were coming ready everybody was ready engineer everybody was ready but Elvis wasn't showing up and uh, then he had come back and he had look and it was just he could not get in the mood he just could not uh, feel like singing Christmas songs because it just didn't feel like Christmas to him and I think it was Felton's idea and finally said when he needs a tree of course, the musicians were just kind of laughing at it because every time he left and they delayed the sessions, that was just more money piling up for them. <laughs> you know, so they were like, they didn't care if he got in the mood that quickly or not, you know, but because they said, oh, don't go get no Christmas ornaments. Don't go get no tree. But anyway, Mary, uh, I had a farm in Thompson Station, and Mary's father lived close by, Papa Lynch and Mama Lynch. So anyway, we went out and got a Christmas tree and uh, decorated the tree all up. And uh, so when he came back in, he saw the tree and... Uh, I don't think it matters to say that he cried. He actually just cried, and Fred shaking his head. That was Elvis, the heart of Elvis. And he cried and cried, and then once he got through with that, he was so touched and moved by that. So that's when he did his um, Christmas album, and, and uh, the boys all got aggravated because we went and got the tree and got it all ready and got him in the Christmas mood <laughs> where he could do his album. But uh, I'm always glad to see Fred because I feel so connected to my friends um, Felton and Mary and Elvis. Any of the rest of you ever done a Christmas album in the summertime and had to do something well, like I that? I wrote some Christmas songs for Marty Robbins. And Marty used to call me his pressure putter. You know, for us golfers, that means something to you all that don't play golf. You'll learn about it when you take it up. But uh, he, would, he would call like in June and say, I'm going to start a Christmas album at the end of this month or the first of next. And uh, he said, I need a couple of songs from you because I was writing for his publishing company at the time. And, I was just like you're talking about. I thought, Christmas in the middle of the summer like this? How do you write Christmas songs? And I did just what she's talking about. Put me up a Christmas tree, baked cakes, filled the house with good smelling potpourri and stuff that smelled like Christmas, and finally did get in the mood, wrote two, three Christmas songs that day, presented them to the publishing company the following week, and he cut two of them in one album. So it does work if you work hard at it. Well, let me say this, uh, Bill, if you asked him about it. Yeah, we cut a Christmas album in June. And so uh, uh, Kelsey Hurston uh, called Fred Carter and said, Fred, bring some kind of uh, something to get us in a Christmas mood. And uh, so I didn't want that to be unless it'd be a, a good little fifth of liquor or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> that'll get me in the mood, baby. Well, I want you to know, in a little studio at RCA, Victor Records, you know, here, <laughs> Fred Carter brought a little, about an a eighth, by 10 picture of a house back you seen that house go by with, with a Budweiser beer uh, commercial it's just a picture of a house with snow and a tree there and once you get over to the drums you can't even see it I mean how can you see it but he brought that up and hung it up and we had the greatest laugh over that thing and uh, I think somebody did go get a fifth that so soon after that <laughs> Because you could say, no, but we cut that Christmas <laughs> with a little bitty picture. That's all we had in that whole big studio. Jan, you might have been on this session. Didn't Johnny Cash actually have some snow brought in one time, some artificial snow and stuff to the old Quonset hut when he was doing a Christmas album? Some reindeer? <laughs> I think he got that turned around. It was snow, brought some, had him bring some cash in. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jean Shepard a while ago said something about uh, talking to her young grandchildren about people who didn't have things at Christmas time. I have a great friend, Merle knows her quite well. Her name is Bree Murphy. Bree is the only woman head cinematographer in that union out in California. She did all the work on uh, Michael Landon's uh, Little House on the Prairie and She's won an uh, Oscar and an Emmy and all of that. She sponsored a family down in Mexico, a father and a mother and 11 children. He was a master shipbuilder, and she would go get him and bring him into Hollywood, and he'd build a gorgeous, uh, they had no business down where he was, it had dried up. He'd build a gorgeous desk for a head of a studio, 
and uh, it'd be worth several thousand dollars, and the guy would give him a couple of hundred dollars. Well, he'd take that $200 and go back to Mexico. They could live for several months on it down there. So one time we decided we'd take him something for Christmas. So uh, Bree and I went to a store called the White Front Store, kind of like Kmart is here. Now, I think I spent $50, $75. I don't know what it was. But we got all these presents, and we drove down to San Diego. We were met by a taxi. And she, he said, we're going on Gomez Mendez Airlines. I said, okay. So this guy drove through the town and went out to a little uh, airstrip. It looked like Smiling Jack with that windsock hanging down. And he hung up his taxi cab driver's hat and put on his airline pilot's hat. It said Gomez Mendez Airlines. <laughs> Well, we got aboard. We couldn't fly over the mountains. We had to fly through them and around like this. So we went down to Manzanilla, and we slept in a hut with a dirt floor. And these, uh, all 11 children, and they had what they called a fiesta for us. They made us uh, food, and we had a good time on the beach. And I'd never spent such a satisfying time in my life because they later told me it was the only time in the lives of those children where all 11 of them had something new at the same time. Mm -hmm. Jack, were you, you, I know he was. I thought you were trying to, uh, to get my attention there to add a story. Oh, you're going to, you're going to be Dickie's mic, Stan. Now he plays that guitar left-handed, so be careful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Skeeter, you were uh, talking about how dumb you were earlier today. Well, I think, uh, talking about dumb, I don't know if anybody's ever done anything this dumb, but uh, I, I did a show uh, during the holidays at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary one time, and uh, I was trying to think of something, you know, that they'd really dig and get them in the Christmas spirit. So uh, I sing, I'll be home for Christmas. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And is this... Paper cups and shoes started coming at me. I realized that, you know, maybe that wasn't such a good choice, but uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try a little bit of that. This is the first time I've done it since then, so y'all might help me out with it a little bit. I'll be home for Christmas. Bill, I heard, I read somewhere, and I, I, I think it's true, that that song was written by a 17-year-old boy while in the armed forces in Europe in World War II. Uh, he was in Germany. Uh, that was written by it's him. It's a very sad song. Yeah. It's really, nice, really neat to sing it and not have anything thrown at you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I bet you really got a hand on that deal. <laughs> Foot, too. No, but there's... Um, I, everybody here has probably performed at one time or another in a prison. Oh, I mean, we've all done benefits. Right. I did Some, work one somebody, were, were you on the one, Skeeter, where, where we were with Homer and Jethro, and we were talking uh, the other day about 
how Homer and Jethro could always come up with something. I remember we were doing a show at the Nebraska State Penitentiary, I think, and Homer and Jethro were on the stage, and this one prisoner got up and kind of started walking down the aisle. <laughs> Homer looked at him, where do you think you're going? <laughs> where was there to go? <laughs> Bill, I, I have a little Christmas uh, prison. Dale Reeves will remember. Oh, man. <laughs> Hank Jr. was singing at the Tennessee prison here in Nashville. The old Disney Disney World, what we used to call Disney World East, and Hank Jr. started doing some a whole lot of shaking or something, and those prisoners started to riot, and Dale ran and jumped in this big old box, <laughs> and everybody was looking for Dale when things calmed down, and he raised that lid up and he said, "Is the coast clear?" <laughs> It's worth a gift of barbells. <laughs> <laughs> I put all them barbells out there and got in that thing. And, and it was close, you know. And it, but, man, they was, I mean, they were riding. I they was trying start, to get in before you. You knocked me out. I, I know it. Everybody knows I was trying to get in that thing because I was hiding. Cause I, I, but they, they got them under control. But uh, finally, someone come back there and says, where's Dale? And I raised that thing up. I said, you know, it's right over. <laughs> This really didn't have a thing to do with Christmas, but a couple of no, the guys didn't. over there are laughing because we played the Utah State Prison one time. Jan, you may have been with us. I don't remember. And when the drummer, the drummer went to put the drums back on the bus, he said, this drum case feels heavy. And he took the top off and there was a guy in there, was in the drum case. And, and my drummer looked at us and said, are you trying to escape? The guy said, yep. <laughs> Bill, do you remember when we worked the Connecticut Maximum Security Prison? Remember that? And uh, we went out there, and I mean, they had guards everywhere, everywhere. And I, I was very uncomfortable. And, uh, but anyway, we, we did it. And the next day, I mean, there was prisoners backstage serving cake and coffee and everything. The next day, <laughs> we went to the bank, and uh, this uh, teller said, oh, you all, you know, we're here again this year and everything. And I said, yeah, we, but we were off yesterday and we worked the prison he said you did and i said uh yeah and he said i'm surprised they had any more entertainment out there i said what do you mean he said a jazz group was there a, a month ago and they had a, a somebody held a, a couple of the the, the uh, entertainers hostage and it was an escape and somebody was don't you remember that somebody was Tab, this we're really getting away from the uh, well, Christmas I, no, no, thing you're here. not, because we played. Hey, Merle, we went up. They we done so good out here that uh, the man from Kentucky wanted us up there. Man, we went up to Kentucky, and this was three days before Christmas. That's right. Now this is a fact. I just happened to think about this, and so the 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 what's that man head of this? What's it he called up there? Big the warden. boss man. Yeah. He come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Joe, yeah. He come and told us. He said, "Boys, I don't want nothing said about food or nothing else." He said because, and he said we're going to have two shows. He said because they've been writing here, and he said we're going to give them a big Christmas dinner three days away. But he said, right now they've been on bread and crackers. <laughs> or uh, crackers and way out water. Yeah. I swear to you, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what I want. And the first, wait a minute, Harold Morrison was on the show. He opened the show up, and the first thing Harold Morrison right? said was, Lady, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't nothing being in there. And he said, I come by my <laughs> uncle's place down here, and he said, uh, he just bought him a new slice, a slice. A baloney slicer. <laughs> I said, "Oh Lord, let me go try to find some place to hide." But that, but uh, we, we got to those two shows, and Hank Jr. was on it, and it was just fantastic. But now they were going to get Christmas dinner in two days. In early 1973, Farron Young and I worked the prison right here in Nashville, and I think Farron had done that many times. He used to go out there and and give of his talent and his service to to uh, entertain those boys out there. And they didn't care a whole lot about hearing me sing. They, they didn't want to hear nothing I had to say, but they liked looking. You know, they just looked, but they didn't want to hear me sing. They didn't care too much about what Farron was doing. 
But David Allen Cole was with us, and he went out there and destroyed the house that day. Just absolutely, they loved him to death because I, I think they were trying to figure out whether he was one of them or should be. <laughs> give give little Jim your mic there. Bobby and Sonny Osborne, you know the guys. And Sonny was telling me this story. They were playing this mental institution at Christmas. And they were on stage doing their thing, and they had a balcony around up there in this little auditorium. And some of these people were leaning way out over it. And he said one time when they ended one of their songs, this old boy leaned way out over that balcony and said, Play a record! <laughs> And Bobby turned around and Sonny said, there ain't too much wrong with that old boy. <laughs> well, uh, Bill? I think Fred. Fred? Oh. I was just sitting here, you know, thinking about um, when I first broke into the music business, I was a promotion man with Mercury Records. In those days, uh, when a label signed an artist they had a lot of faith in, the first thing they do is try to get them a Christmas hit. Because that showed the DJs, you know, that they were going to stick with them, you know, whether they made it this record or not. So, Patty Page was a promising artist on Mercury. And they found her a Christmas song. One of the more unfortunate ones, I believe. It's called Boogie Woogie Santa Claus. Like and it was shipped out, and it, nobody would play it. They'd play it one time and say, oh, Lord. Somebody in Kansas City just said, I'm going to turn that over and see what's on the other side. It's Tennessee Waltz. Oh, wow. Fred, when did she do How Much Is That Doggy in the Window? Marin Worth had the country hit on it here, but. Uh, hmm. um, he Me and you, neither one don't know, do 57, we? I Bill? Think, <laughs> Bill? When, yeah. I w when we were talking about what I did a while ago, I purposely didn't tell you about going to the prison the next year to get a couple people from there because I thought, well, you shouldn't start talking about all this prison stuff. But since everybody has, <laughs> I was going to say that I did, uh, I did go and I did get a couple of young, young girls from there too. And they will. And as we're talking about this, we can talk about it and we can tell these stories and do these descriptive things. But I might just interject this right here, that that is a thing that I don't know if y'all know you can do that, but there are things you can do. You can make Christmases happier for other people. And and uh, and the girls that, you know, after the girl got out of prison, I mean, they were out for that little while. They went back. I've heard from them, and they made something out of their lives. And then I did get to go. I did a, it wasn't, it was a pre-Christmas show, but it was at Lewistown at the penitentiary there. And Jimmy Hoffa was in the prison at that time. And he had been to, when he was in Nashville, he had come to the Opry and he liked my singing. And so they had requested I come and do a show there. So I went there and, and like I said, we, we were doing Christmas songs. It wasn't, it was about three or four days before Christmas, but they let this young man be with us all day and he was carrying my things for me. And I was kind of embarrassed because when the band, they asked us if we did, they said, well, you need to ask you this. Do you have any uh, knives? Uh, you know, are you guys carrying any knives, any pocket knives? And Oh, my band said no, no, you know, and I never, and I had, I'm, after I became a vegetarian, I always had a little knife because I'd get some lettuce and fig I could always have a salad when I couldn't find anything else I could eat, you know. Anyway, so all of a sudden I was so embarrassed because I had my little Swiss Army knife they took. But anyway, we went in there and we sang, and uh, what was so meaningful about that, I did hear from so many prisoners, so many prisoners' wives, that, that they became Christians, they found God, and they, they were really, they made jokes about having a captive audience. You know, you do all those little things that we talk about and laugh about and uh, everything. But I think that, um, you know, and here again, I, a lot of children, some people have children, grandchildren. I had no children. So I made all these things my causes and my children. But, and you do get so much more out of it than you give. But uh, the young boy that happened to be with us that day, that was, they were letting him be kind of our, person that was helping us and everything it turned out that he had been in prison for about 14 years and had been there since he was a young man and so I tried to keep up with him anyway it's really a challenge uh, that I would even give out today as we talk about all this to try to seek out those things and try to make Christmas happier for some of those you know that that um, are less fortunate than we Bill, I'll tell you a great Christmas present I just thought of that I got for, from a man that I always think about when I hear Christmas songs Eddie Arnold I had written three or four songs for Eddie and worked with him on an album. 
and my wife said, Merle, guess who's on the phone? I said, who is it? I'm in the bathroom. He said, it's Eddie Arnold. I said, wow, Eddie Arnold, he's never called me. I said, hello, Eddie, and he said, Merle, Merry, Merry Christmas. I said, well, Eddie, that's so sweet of you to call and wish me Merry Christmas. He said, I've got a Christmas gift for you, my boy. I said, a Christmas gift, what can it be? He said, I guess you've heard that I've recorded Make the World Go Away. I said, well, Eddie, everybody in town's talking about it. It should be a six million seller at least. He said, I hope so, my boy. I put your song the easy way on the backside of it. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> it sold six million copies. In Great line story. with what Skeeter was saying, uh, I've played a lot of prisons. I've played women's prisons, and I've seen some of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. And they look, they look up at you, and a tear in their eyes if you sing a ballad or something. And God, your, my heart goes out to them. And we find a lot of talent in there, some pretty good songwriters and musicians. And I've, uh, I've corresponded with them, and we've had their material sent up and so on like that. I haven't been lucky in having uh, getting a cut, but... We've corresponded with them, and uh, the show may be going into some prisons right now. So uh, I send good words to them. There's a lot of good guys in there, and they'll come out okay. There's some that'll just hang around and be back in there, too, they won't because they don't listen. Well, that's my sermon for today, folks. <laughs> uh, pass, pass the plate, will you? We don't talk enough about uh, Eddie Arnold, I don't think because he probably was one of the most influential men uh, that was ever in this business. And he changed our whole business around when his wonderful style came on the scene back then. I'd like to uh, do a public thanks to him because in 1949, I was a broke disc jockey in Texas, and he said, if you ever want to come to Nashville, call me up and we'd like to have you on the radio. I came into Union Station with a little better than eight dollars in my pocket and uh, at his invitation he said it's so near christmas you come and stay with me out at my house and we'll get all this done right after christmas is over so i stayed there and right after christmas he took me down to nashville and got me a job on the radio at wmak i later became the number one disc jockey there thank the good lord and started my checkered career here in this town so I can lay it all at the doorstep to, uh, of the the kindness and the goodness of Eddie Arnold. Boy, nothing like being together with friends and people you love at Christmas time. I hope y'all have had as much fun with this as I have and oh, it's just it's terrific. Yeah. Billy Walker hasn't sung for us. You're right, I'm right. not singing and I'm raring to sing. <laughs> raring to sing and can't yes, sing for raring. That's right. All right, lay one on us. All right, here's uh, an old song that uh, we recorded in an album uh, last year and it's called Winter Wonderland. So gang, if you'll hit me a sleigh bells ring. Are you listening in the lane? Snow is glistening. A beautiful sight. We're happy to die. Walking in a winter wonderland. Gone away is the bluebird. Here to stay is the new bird. We sing a love song as we go along, walking in a winter wonderland. In the meadow we will build a snowman and pretend his name is Parson Brown. He'll say, are you married? We'll say, no man. But you can do the job when you're in town. Later on, we'll conspire as we dream by the fire to face and afraid the plans that we made walking in a winter wonderland come on man Say, are you married? We'll say, no, man. You can do the job when you're in town. Later on, we'll conspire 
as we dream by the fire to face and afraid the plans that we made walking in a winter wonderland oh walking in a winter wonderland hey, yeah. <laughs> that's great good job did it i loved it i loved it did it snow where you were when you were a young boy growing up? Did you well, have white yeah. Christmases? Well, one time out in Lubbock, Texas, and back about 1940-something like that, you know, there's nothing to hold back the north wind in west Texas except a barbed wire fence. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't do a very good job. And so in 1940, we had an ice storm, and then we had a snowstorm on top of the ice storm. And of course, all the power lines broke down. And of course, we didn't have much power out where we lived, but we got caught visiting my brother over in Lubbock, Texas. And we spent one miserable Christmas over there because nobody had any fire or they didn't have any uh, wood because there's not a whole lot of trees in West Texas, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, it's so dry out there that when a guy uh, faints, they throw, throw sand in his face instead of water because water is that scarce out there. But you bet you they get some snows out in West Texas. Yeah, not exactly winter wonderland when you're uh, struggling to stay warm. Though, no, that's it? right. <laughs> Oswald said he spent one Christmas, uh, or maybe more than one Christmas, with Roy Acuff in Australia. That's now, right. it's summertime in Australia at Christmas time, right? Oh, yeah. Could you get in the Christmas spirit with it being uh, 90 well, degrees or whatever? I stayed pretty well, you know. In the spirit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, look, don't know much about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he thought I said spirits instead of spirit. Yeah. But I, I don't know. It just seems to me that would be so funny to be somewhere like Australia or, or in the other hemisphere, you know, where it's warm at Christmas time. Well, it's it's funny feeling to come back in the snow and leave a hot sunshine. Yeah. It's it's funny. Like I've seen pictures of they have Santa Clauses down there running around little short outfits. Oh, yeah. Skimpy uh, outfits and things. Yeah. Speaking of outfits, y'all haven't seen what's behind the green door back here. We've got something. Uh, yeah, I think we need to see what's behind door number one. Speaking of the outfits right here. Here they come. <laughs> Yeah, Miss Country Soul in her 90, and who's your friend? Her name is Samantha Jane Sweet Thing, and uh, Santa Claus brought her to me the Christmas of 1969. So that means we're both 29 now. <laughs> and that's my story. <laughs> and you're sticking to it. <laughs> but uh, one of, um, of course, I love the song all year round, but I can remember when I used to tune into the Grand Ole Opry during the Christmas season, always to hear Marion Worth sing a song that I like so very much. Remember Shake Me, I Rattle? Yeah. I have to go over here and sit down. Okay, go over there and uh, take your friend, sit down. Yeah. Jimmy Dickens is looking at that doll dying to do Raggedy Ann. Well, She's grown a lot. Yeah. <laughs> she sure has. We don't, yeah, we don't, we don't know what happened to Dickens, but there we go. yeah, I th are you comfortable there? I think. Okay, I think we're ready, Mr. Katz. toy shop on the corner of the square when I saw a little girl peeking in the window there she was looking at a dolly in a dress of rosy red and around the little dolly hung a little sign that read shake me On the corner of the square Where I saw another dolly In the window there I 
Beautiful. Do you know the way? Do you notice the way Johnny Russell was looking at your doll there? I know, I did. It worried me. <laughs> but she she can handle him. <laughs> what you gonna do for Christmas? What am I gonna do? You gonna for stay Christmas? home. What are you gonna do? You know what? Um, I can't remember exactly w when I started doing this, but I started going. I love it when the Grand Ole Opry is at Christmas time because I do love to be at the Opry at Christmas and with all my extended family. And I love to go over to the Opryland Hotel, and I usually go to that Christmas dinner on yeah. Christmas Day because I don't like to cook. <laughs> well, that's a good dinner. I want to say one thing. You don't do too. kitchens. I, was, I don't do kitchens well. But all I the do. girls were talking earlier, you know, about growing up and wanting dolls. I was really fortunate. A lot of my dolls were homemade. A lot of my dolls were rag dolls. And I had a lot of stuffed teddy bears and everything. So I was fortunate <laughs> that way. But I always lined them all up and made them be my audience. <laughs> Isn't oh, that oh, oh. <laughs> That's how I played with dolls. I made him buy tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, tell us about the dolls you had growing up. <laughs> Bill, can I tell everybody, every Friday night before Christmas at the Grand Ole Opry backstage, I think most of y'all know this, but we have a Christmas party, my band and myself. My guys' wives cook, and I cook for three days. And last year, it, it, this has been like seven or eight years now, and we, last year I think we fed like 100, 150 people. But it's every Friday night, just right before Christmas, we make the sausage balls and the deviled eggs and everything. And the, we, had a, we had a catastrophe a couple of years ago. Benny put the deviled eggs in the back of the car and they turned over. <laughs> well, you had scrambled eggs, didn't you? We had scrambled eggs. <laughs> hey, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but they ought to get a shot of Dickens' boots here. Beautiful. Have you seen, I've never seen a pair of boots Ooh. that pretty in all my oh, life. That's a leggy man. Christmas boots. Don't look like the leg. Oh, <laughs> Those are beautiful. <laughs> hey, that, that record, uh, Marion Worth's record, what, wasn't that produced by Owen Bradley? No. No, it's a Don Law record. Brown oh, that's right. Yeah. She was on Columbia. Oh, I, I, yeah. was, I don't know why I was thinking did, did, did Marion write that song yeah. or who wrote really? it? Yeah. I thought this was Patty Page. I don't know. What, a, what a great song. What a beautiful uh, little story. Patty yeah. Page had that originally. Uh, tell them one you know. Yeah. Uh, well, not that one. Uh, but I know she had that. We had a record shop. We sold the records. Oh, yeah. Does anybody and, know who wrote the song? No, I don't know who I don't wrote it. I think anybody it. knows. It's a beautiful song. I'll take it. Uh, I'm not going to copy right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to tell you. <laughs> I was going to tell you a little story about Patty Page and the Tennessee Waltz. 
uh, you know, we had that store in Wheeling. We sold uh, all country records. It wasn't an artist that could come in there that they wouldn't find their records in our store. I made sure that we had everybody. And then uh, we sold uh, the rhythm and blues, the rock and roll. And we had the two different trades. And uh, I had to listen to the radio in places to know what to buy in the rock and roll field and the rhythm and blues. They told me where to listen. And one of the places to listen was at w, uh, WLAC here in Nashville. And so, uh, yep, that's right. So I knew where to listen to get that. And I always listened to the radio, you know, for the new records that come out. And I heard P Patty Page on a, a pop station do Tennessee Waltz. So I said to Stoney, I said, Stoney, you and Mr. Lewis is going to have to go to Pittsburgh in the morning, buy every record that the distributor has of Patty Page on Tennessee Waltz. Well, he said, I don't, do we have to go in the morning? I said, yes, you do, to get the records, because we got to have those things. So they went up there, and they bought every record Mercury had, brought them down, and we were the only state, a store there in Wheeling that had Tennessee Waltz for about two weeks. And Boogie Woogie Santa Claus. On the back. That's right. <laughs> That's why I knew. Yeah. Speaking of dollies, Merle Kilgore wrote a big song back, uh, what was it, Merle, late 50s, early 60s? Uh, 1960. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it Frankie Miller that had the, the first Miller. record on this? But yeah. then you recorded it too, didn't you? Right. No, I, 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 yes, I did record it on Starday, I forgot. But Frankie had the first record. Tommy Hill produced it on him. And uh, this is really not a Christmas song, but because of Christmas it happened. Uh, I was manager of uh, KCIJ. You remember that station, T. Tommy? Very well. He made that station famous. I came along and tore it down, but hey, it was a living. <laughs> it, it was a little rough back in those days after T. Tommy left and Tommy Sands. I'm not kidding you. They took the listeners somewhere. And times were tough. And my wife said, Merle, bring home a Christmas tree. We've got to have a Christmas tree. I said, let me tell you something, my dear. I got a deal with the guy at the A&P. He's going to get me a tree for nothing. And we'll just have to wait the day before Christmas. So that year, they had a run on Christmas trees. There was no Christmas trees at the A&P. And everything else I looked was horrible looking. So I told the guy, I said, man, what am I going to do? You promised me a tree. He said, I got it. He had the most beautiful, life-size probably a 10-foot photograph of a tree with all the ornaments in living color, in living color. And I brought that home. My wife looked at me and said, you got to be kidding. That's right. you got to be kidding. I said, the kids will never know the difference. They're real little. So we scotch taped that tree up and put presents under it. And she called Merle me will cheap. Do that. Only Merle will do that. <laughs> But the kids loved that tree. It was so beautiful. And we thought about holding it over to next Christmas. But when we took it off the wall, the scotch tape ate up the picture. But anyway, the kids, the kids were doing a little thing under the tree. And I said, Pam did the jig. Steve beat the drum. And Kim rocked her dolly. And uh, so my wife said, well, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And I said, you think that's pretty good? So I wrote this little song. Would you please? <laughs> Remember this now, that beautiful 3D almost <laughs> Christmas tree. <laughs> as I sit here in this old folks home, my hair is white as snow. I remember back when I was young again, how everything was jolly. When sister did the jig and brother beat the drum and baby rocked her doll, baby rocked her doll. Them kids of mine have all grown up, but they ride every now and then. As I read their letters, it brings memories of all our fun and folly. When sister did the jig and brother beat the drum, baby rocked her doll. Baby rock your dolly. That wife of mine, God rest her soul, she's gone on before me. 
Bet she told the Lord all about the times Our house was filled with folly But sister did the jig and brother beat the drum Baby rocked her dolly Baby rocked her dolly Well, the man across the hall is a lonely man He's never had a family So he asked me to tell him all about my kids When he's feeling melancholy But sister did the jig and brother beat the drum And baby rocked her dolly Baby rocked her dolly Every night I pray for them kids of mine I wish they were back with me But before I die, Lord, let me see A sight to make me jolly Sister do the jig and brother beat the drum Baby rock her dolly And baby rock her dolly song okay. yeah Dale. turned out to be great didn't it yeah okay merle you were in shreveport you were in north louisiana or jimmy newman was in south louisiana yeah how'd, how'd they celebrate christmas in south louisiana pretty much the same as uh, anywhere else really and our food was pretty much the same we had of course had to have rice with everything where like y'all would have uh, everybody else would have cornbread dressing we had uh, rice dressing and of course we had uh, we have the wildlife in, in Louisiana, the game wild game that uh, really enhances our Christmas dinner. You know the wild ducks and and all of that, but uh, it's pretty much the same. You know, there's a little more eating going on <laughs> in our part of the country, but uh, it's it's a wonderful time of year. And by the way, May and I, and my wife, we always go uh, home for Christmas and. Uh, to Louisiana, uh, we we tried not to for a few years, and it don't it don't sound right, don't Word. feel right. So, <laughs> we even spent a white Christmas in Gatlinburg, and that was more worse than. than <laughs> <laughs> wish we could uh, celebrate it in Tennessee, cause we love Tennessee. But at that time, it, it, as y'all know, and I think we'll all agree, that's the time to go home, you know, and be with family. Mm -hmm. You've got a Cajun song, I think, Christmas song, don't you? Yeah, my niece and I came up with a little song. You know, you receive these Christmas cards, and I'm sure uh, y'all, all of you have uh, Joyous Noel, J-O-Y-O-U-S. Well, really, in French, you know, like we we will say, that's Merry Christmas, and, and we'll uh, say Merry Christmas uh, in English if we're holding, but if we're holding a French conversation or visiting with some of the older people that don't speak English that still just speak French, you, you, Merry Christmas will do because they know what you're saying, but Joyeux Noel is really the French way to say Merry Christmas. Joyeux means joyous. It's, it's there on, on a lot of the Christmas cards. So uh, would, <laughs> would you like to, for me to quit talking and go ahead and do a little bit of it? Do whatever, I've never done it Whatever before. you want to do, it's Christmas time. My niece, yes, my niece and I uh, put this together, as I said, and Peggy and Newman, I'll dedicate this for you. could be with us, celebrate the season in our Cajun way. There won't be many presents underneath the tree, but there's nothing like the love of a Cajun family. Why you know well means a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year means a bon honey. Why you know well wish you could be with Celebrate the season in our Cajun way. But there's nothing like the love of a Cajun family. Why, you know, well, means a Merry Christmas. Happy New Year means a bon honey. Why, you know, well, wish you could be with us. Celebrate. 
break the season in our kitchen way. Celebrate the season and in our hey, way. That's what I meant to say. Merry Christmas, why you the way I want to? See you while I go. That's great, Jimmy. What'd you say, Tater? I want all you folks, the lights are up on my house. They're all up, and I want you to come by and see them. And stop in, if you will, and see Miss Mona and I. Will you do that at Christmas? This Christmas? Absolutely, yeah. Got about 7,000 lights for you to view. Started on them in October. Put them up every year for the past 10 years, uh, just for the kids in the neighborhood. One little boy met me in Kroger's one day and said, where's Santa Claus? He wasn't on the chimney. I wasn't going to put him up last year. And when he asked me, I said, he's a little late. He'll be up there. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> and I went straight as I could go and bought the biggest one I could find and put him on top of the house for the little kids in the neighborhood and the Baptist children's home that we talked about a while ago. They bring the buses by for the children, and they all get out and look at the lights, and I go down and visit with them. Okay? Well, what a nice Merry thing Christmas. to do. That's Merry the Christmas spirit. Christmas That's Christmas wonderful. Spirit. You know, uh, they'll probably name it, Bill. Little Jimmy Dickens, Opera Land, this next year. <laughs> Two more months, yeah. I, um, what my daughter and I love to do is go sing for the kids at the Baptist Children's Home. And uh, Mike Huff uh, gets that ready every year, and uh, he's a great insurance guy in Brentwood, and it's a real treat to go sing for those kids. And another thing that we like to do at Christmas time, we just started doing that, is to sing for the children at the psychiatric ward at Vanderbilt Hospital. Oh, okay, yeah. It's wonderful. It's really great. A lot of you go, don't you, to um, Baptist, isn't it Baptist Hospital, yeah. where a lot of people from the Grand Ole Opry go and, yeah. and sing Christmas carols and, and this kind of thing? That's right. Yeah, the retirement veterans hospital. Uh, Jan, Jan's very involved in that. Yeah, the school for the blind. And and is it what's the name of the song we do that uh, uh that we do that they do the they they do all the repeats. Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer and they. They, you know, like a light bulb, you know, that kind of thing. And they have the biggest time. This last year, during the Christmas caroling, we went to the, is it Harry Hillman? Yes. School. Uh, I tell you. Yes. If you ever need a reason to count your blessings, go there and see these, these children. Is it a hospital? It's, no, it isn't for the blind. It's totally... Uh, afflicted, afflicted yes. you know, mentally and physically and everything, and it will oh, break wow. your heart, but it will certainly make you count your blessings. Some of them are children who, I asked the, the lady there, and some of them are children with diseases. And, yeah. Uh, some are uh, accident vic victims, car wreck victims. Mm -hmm. One little girl was there because she fell in a swimming pool and her parents got her out, but when they got her out, it, it was too late. They brought yeah. her back, but it was too, the brain damage had set in. Another one was a car wreck. Uh, another one had a little boy had drank so much cough syrup, and it had done brain damage severely. And you can't imagine. It's no. like Jan says. I mean, you, we're not really talking. Can't. We're not talking light affliction here. Mm -mm. Serious. It's they, so wonderful they that told the people. Us not to touch any of the yes. any of the children. You know, not to go over to them. But we were standing there singing, and there was this one. This one little boy over there in a wheelchair, and just propped up every way for, he, for him to be propped up. And when we started singing, you know, anything out of the ordinary gets them, they get excited and they don't know what to do. Agitated. This, this little boy became so agitated and, and everything, and, and um, I just broke ranks and went over there and patted him and stood there and rubbed his hand, and he calmed down. So I stayed there with him the whole time. But it literally, I went in the restroom and cried because it will break your heart. Yeah. Yeah, it's so wonderful that the, uh, that the people in this room and our brothers and sisters in, in the music business, the ones that have been around a while, the new ones, whoever, that, um, that they take time to do things like that and, and to share. I hope the people watching this can see that uh, ladies and gentlemen of country music, what they do in their spare time when they're off stage and what they try to put back uh, from the business that they've taken from. We're getting a great example from it uh, with these stories today. 
Well, it's like I said when Skeeter was talking, and Skeeter said she never did it for publicity. Nobody in this room does it for the publicity. It's because of, uh, of what's in the hearts. Jeannie's got a great song. I think it would be very appropriate about this time. Christmas is for kids, and we're all kids this, at heart at Christmas. This is one of the songs that I told you that I wrote for the Marty Robbins album that year. I've never sang it publicly before because Marty said he had such a wonderful record on it, it's hard to top his cut on anything, but T. Tommy was a great friend of Marty's, and for all of Marty Robbins' old friends and fans that might happen to be watching our videos, this will be for you. May the children of the world, every boy and every girl, have a bigger and better Christmas day. For they all need a part in somebody's heart, since Christmas is for kids. Anyway, Christmas is for kids. Anyway, you hear this expression every day. So may the ones far and near have a plenty this year. Since Christmas is for kids anyway, may we all look around for a child who's been let down and love him as we would be loved. And regardless of his need, May somebody take heed Since Christmas is for kids anyway Everybody Christmas is for kids anyway You hear this expression great song. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. Well, I just hope everybody here has the merriest Christmas that you've ever had, and it's been wonderful for us all to get together and to share these stories and share the songs and, and share them with our friends who, uh, who watch these videos and watch this television program all over the, the world, really, not only just the United States and Canada, but uh, as uh, Jan was saying earlier, uh, some of these videos go to South Africa. They go to all kinds of different places. I want to ask, nobody knows I'm going to do this, and I hope he is in the control room. We wouldn't all be together here today if it wasn't for a guy named Larry Black who asked us to do these family reunion shows. Larry, are you back there somewhere? You guys who watch these videos, you hear Larry's voice, but you don't ever really get to see him. And uh, come here, Santa Claus. <laughs> this is the guy that, uh, yeah, that's right. We give him a standard. <laughs> You have been so wonderful to, uh, you're the guy that, that spearheaded all this, that got us all together, that said, look, here's the time, here's the place, let's get together, we need to be together. It wouldn't have happened without you. We wish you the merriest of Christmases. We love you. You've done so much for us. This is nothing very fancy, but it's a little scrapbook. It's going to ultimately have a picture of each one of these people in there. Everybody in the cast has autographed oh, it to you. No. We hope that you'll keep it for this Christmas and many Christmases okay. to come and know that it comes with a lot of love from your friends. Oh, guys, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, we love you. Thank you, you guys. Have, uh, you've absolutely brought an incredible joy to me. You guys have been such a delight to work with. And uh, like I said, you've, you've brought a lot of joy. I, it, it's funny how we, every time we start getting sentimental, we want to cut it with a joke somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what you do. You go for the zinger. And, uh, but I really love you, folk. Thank you for making this special.
Thank you. From my standpoint, I just want to say this, and, and you don't put this on the tape, just cut it out, but Larry asked me to kind of be the, the traffic cop here, and uh, I didn't ask to do this. You guys are my heroes. I played your records when I was a disc jockey, and uh, that you'd let me do this, I really appreciate it. You've all been so wonderful to work with. You're just, you're just the ultimate pros. And, and uh, I get stumbling, and I, and I don't know where to go. And one of you jumps in, and you pick, you pick me up, and, and you make it look good. And then I love everybody in this room, and I thank you very much. Like I told you earlier, you do what you do better than anybody in the world could do it, Bill. Here, That's here. why you're there. Thank you, darling. Well, shall we thank wish you. the whole world a Merry Christmas? Yeah. The whole world and our band. And the wonderful band, Mike Johnson, Les Singer, Glenn Duncan, Jimmy Capps, Dirk Johnson, Randy Hardison, and David Smith, who've done a wonderful job playing. And the band leader, little Jimmy Dickens, we're all going to his house and look at the lights, go to Jeannie Pruitt's house and have dinner. Play a little Christmas Times Are Coming, and we'll go out of here on that. Just take it off, Glenn.
Somebody point out a um, Mac Wiseman. Over there, Mac. Over there, all right. Over there. You guys can be seated. You can be seated. You don't have to continue to stand. Thank you, thank you. opportunity from time to time to do television shows, to be invited to special functions and all, and they all 
think that the money that they give us makes the difference and makes up what we come for. But today I have finally seen somebody that has taken the bull by the horns and he's giving a little more than the money. Isn't he has given us something or another that, that we can take home with us and we can appreciate and love and, and I, I appreciate that. To Larry Black here, and here. all of your people. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. You're not black, you're 24 karat gold. Larry, you're going to heaven for this. Not any time soon. Let me pray. Father, thank you for such marvelous people. Thank you that they have been given the opportunity to share themselves with others. You've gifted them in a special way. I thank you for their gift. Thank you for the opportunity of serving them back. Bless this food to their bodies, amen. Yeah. Oh, the books, as soon as we get the rest of the shots from Christmas, we will send you the rest of the shots to fill up the rest of your books. So that'll be after Christmas. And Jan Howard, everybody said shh. Jan Howard mentioned something during the course of the show about a doll, and, and I, BJ gave you one, but uh, we also have a package for you here. Would you give that to Jan Howard over there? Now, if somebody else had mentioned a present during the course of the morning, would have tried to get that too, but I didn't hear any others. I was going to get around so to a car. <laughs> <laughs> so this, Jan, we just were able to run out and get that. I think you'll enjoy it. Now, it's hard to do television and eat at the same time. Okay. 